Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in our study of Paul's second letter to Timothy, and this, I believe, is our fifth session in that study. Uh, all the other previous studies are up on the Bible Talk website. If you've missed any and you want to see them, or if you want to have somebody else watch them, they're there, okay? We share them. We share them. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start that right now. And before we do, I just want to greet you formally. Yes. Greetings in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're really blessed that you, it's really a great thing to be able to come together. I mean, I would prefer to be face to face with you, but if this is all we have, hey, it's, it's good enough. That's good. So on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, we do want to, we want to greet you and welcome you. Yes, we do. Okay. So we're going to start that study right now, or right after Brother Mark here asks for God's blessing on our time together in his word. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we are thankful that we get to come together and study your word. Just show, show us what in your word we need to pull out and apply to our lives. Amen. 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 Yes, and make sure you do apply it to your life, because yes. we need to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. All right, we left off last week in uh, verse 9 of the first chapter of 2 Timothy. Mm -hmm. and so I, I just want to read, I want to read the end of that, or bring us up to date before as we go into verse 10. So it'll flow into the next Yeah, verse. so it does. Mm -hmm. uh, and in verse 9, he got, it talked about Jesus saved us. For God's own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Right? Mm -hmm. God saved us for his own purpose and grace. And then goes on in verse 10 to say, But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard, and quite frankly, I don't like that translation okay. here. On this I mean, particular okay. letter hmm? or verse. On, 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 <laughs> yes, on this verse, there's something in that verse that I don't like the translation, and I don't think it's faithful enough to the Greek. Mm -hmm. um, so I, let me read it this way. But now is manifested by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Not revealed, okay? It's manifested, right. To manifest means to make clear or evident to the eye or the understanding, to prove, put beyond doubt, to show plainly. Mm -hmm. Now, that definition is from the Random House Dictionary and the Collins English Dictionary. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making this stuff up, right? Mm -hmm. There is a very large difference here between God having revealed this plan and now God manifesting the plan. When Abraham took Isaac up the mountain on Mount Moriah, you want to know something? God was revealing his plan. Yes. When the angel of death passed over God's people in Egypt, God was revealing his plan. Amen. When the bronze servant was, serpent was lifted up in the wilderness as they were being attacked by snakes, mm -hmm. and God used that to heal the people, God was revealing his plan. When God saved Noah, and his family with the ark, mm -hmm. that was a revelation of God's plan. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fiery furnace, and Jesus joined them in that furnace, that was a revelation of God's plan. When God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and told us about the suffering servant who would be pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and healed by his stripes, God had given us revelation of his plan. Mm. The Lord revealed his purpose and grace. Get that in? He'd already yes. revealed it. Right, right. He revealed his purpose, his grace, his mercy, and his plan all throughout the history of man. Mm. But then, yes. when, in the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Mm. That's the manifestation, manifestation. of it. Right. Yes. But he's been revealing this all along. Mm. God's plan is revealed from Genesis, right from Genesis, right through right. Revelation 22. But there's a difference between being revealed and being manifest. Right. Okay? 
That's very good. Jesus, the light of the world, was made manifest and abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. That's how that verse mm -hmm. we're studying continues, right? He abolished, isn't that what it says? Yeah. Right? He abolished death and brought life and more immortality to light. In 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55, Paul had written to that church, to the church of Corinth, and he said, when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Listen to what I want to say, but then ponder. Mm. Consider. Death does not exist for believers. Right. Mm -hmm. Doesn't exist. Let's let's it's use been up, abolished. Let's apply a little. That's right. It's been abolished. Mm -hmm. Been wiped out. So, but let's use a little logic from the Word of God, right? Okay. In Hebrews 9.27, it says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment, mm -hmm. it's appointed for men to die once. Okie dokie. Yes. It was appointed for me. It was appointed for you. It was appointed for us to die once. I already did that. Mm -hmm. wasn't so bad. Because the Word of God says, and I have been professing this for 40-some-odd years, mm -hmm. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20. And what it says in Colossians, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It's appointed a man to die once. When you have been born again, have accepted Jesus Christ, you've died. It's over and done. You don't have to die again. You don't, you will not die again. You have been given the gift of eternal life. You can't die. Mm -mm. We just put off the perishable and put on the imperishable. We move out of this house and into a new. That, that's, that's all death is. And that <clears throat> has to, when that becomes the reality of our thinking, mm. the world will sit up and take notice. That's right. Okay. We won't see the fear of death. Because we should have no fear of death. Exactly. You know, I'm sure you, if you've been following us at all, you do know that last year Alice had stage three cancer. And when I first heard that, I mean, you know, I I, I was uh, in the hospital and the doctors had done a minor operation and discovered the cancer. That's what the doctor came out and bolting with his name, a guy from London, mm -hmm. and came out and told me that Alice had cancer. It was like getting punched in the stomach first. I mean, that's what it felt like. But... I went upstairs and I opened my to the room where I was waiting because she was still in recovery. And I started praying and God just spoke to me and, and he reassured me of this truth. Mm -hmm. And then later we found out that, that it had gone to stage three cancer and she had to have another operation. And then she had to go to an oncologist for, for treatment. <laughs> and it happened that the oncologist was a Muslim fellow from originally from Lahore, Pakistan. And when we met him, I, I think he's accustomed to meeting people for the first time. And it's like, OK, you know, this is this is really kind of bad, you know, stage three cancer. And we said, no, that's not, that's not a problem. Alice doesn't have cancer. And he, he gave me a strange look. I said, no, Alice doesn't have cancer. Her flesh has cancer. But Alice is not her flesh. Alice is spirit. And he kind of was taken aback by that that wound up having an impact because we got to do a lot of ministering to him okay it's just it's true so jesus could say to martha the sister of mary and lazarus right and he's saying this to us all jesus said to martha i am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live even if he dies and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? John 11, 25 and 26. That's still a good question. Mm -hmm. Do you believe this? You'll, Amen. You, I mean, do you believe this? 
If you believe it, you have no fear of death. That's right. If you can't, if you, if you believe the words of Jesus Christ, you'll never die because you already did. Then death has no power over you. You're not if you death. receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's, We're talking about believers. Okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we, uh, you, you just. I'm sorry. It threw you off. Threw me off because I want to, I, I've said this before. If you are happen to be watching this and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you haven't received that manifestation of his grace and forgiveness and his glory, his salvation, this Bible study is not really intended for you mm. because you'll find it very, very difficult to understand yeah. without the Holy Spirit. Exactly, yes. Okay, so I would pray that if you happen to be watching this and you don't know him, that the Spirit of God would touch you and you would receive that free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. But if, if you are saved, then, you know, you're, you're supposed to have a knowledge of this. And all I'm doing, I, listen, I shouldn't be telling you anything new. Yeah, okay. Maybe I'm reinforcing something you've heard before, because by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is confirmed. Mm -hmm. But you have no fear of death. There's no reason for you to have fear of death. Okay? Live like it. Act like it. The righteous are as bold as a lion. I'm telling you what, we're to have a whole different attitude than the world and the people of the world. And the only fear that we're supposed to have is, is a fear, fear of God. God. Amen. Which is not oh no it's no ah it's it, awe. it's to be an awe of God. Yes. Who is an awesome God? Who is a consuming fire? Amen. Amen. All right, so let's go right on to verse eleven then, right? Mm -hmm. He's talking about this, this message, right? And he says, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Paul says that he was appointed. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, it didn't matter if it was Paul's great desire to be this. It certainly wasn't the desire of Saul of Tarsus. No, it wasn't. <laughs> you know, who was quite the opposite. This who was Paul before that road to Damascus experience. That's right. He had no desire to build up the church back then. Or it certainly wasn't, you know, think about the hesitation of Moses or Jeremiah to receive the call that God had. Or think about the exuberance of Isaiah, you know, in Isaiah 6 in the, in the temple, in the throne room of God. Mm -hmm. And God says, who can I send? And here's Isaiah. Here am I, send me. It's, it's not a matter. It's, it's a matter of God's calling. Whatever God calls you to, whatever God appoints you to, he will equip you for. And whatever it is, there's nothing too mundane. Every service of God is is majestic. Okay? You know, I, I don't want to, I, of course I don't want to sidetrack myself. I just do it all the time. <laughs> but, you know, Alice and I spend an awful lot of time over in the UK, in, in England. As a matter of fact, we're going back over shortly. And they have a thing there called a royal warrant. Mm -hmm. And a royal warrant, you may, have, may or may not have heard of it. You'll go by shops, and on, a, on one shop you may see a sign, and it says, by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen. Mm -hmm. That's a royal warrant. It's a declaration that they receive from the Queen or the King, whoever might be in power, that this person or this, this business has been appointed to provide certain service. That's as high as you can get, I mean. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they get that royal warrant it means that they were appointed to do this thing for the queen. And there's really, I, I mean, there's such a power in that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it says, and whatever you do, whatsoever you find to put your hand to, do with all your mind. Whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. Everything that you do, whether and I use this expression, whether you're a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker, mm -hmm. no matter what you, what you are doing, do it, if you're doing it as unto the Lord, you are doing it with a royal warrant. Yes. You are doing it in service, not to the Queen of England, but to the King of Kings. Yes. Hallelujah. And that ought to put a smile in your heart. I'll tell you what. Because the Lord God is certainly working his plan, his will, and his good pleasure in your life. I mean, it's that simple, right? Mm -hmm. And then verse 12, as we zoom right along, Paul says, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him 
until that day, that day being the great and terrible day of the Lord, Hayom Yahweh. Paul suffered. There's no doubt. I mean, go read the New Testament. Go read um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12 and see, I mean, what Paul went through to, to serve God. But he's not ashamed. We talked about the fact that he's writing this letter to Timothy from prison, from prison in Rome. Mm -hmm. He was not ashamed to be a prisoner for Jesus Christ. Because, as he will tell Timothy here shortly, our, our goal is to be approved unto God. Study to show yourself approved unto God. We need the approval of God. Not the approval of the world. Not the approval of men. But when you know that God is... is approving what you're doing, the way you're doing it, what, that should give you a satisfaction that puts a glow on your face. Absolutely. It, it really should. I mean, that's, that's true. You know, you go to work and you do that. That Mark's an electrician and he works for a company. Uh, it's, some people, I, I don't know, I don't want to say it's menial, but it's, it's, you know, it's not. How would you describe your job? Boring. <laughs> He'd say it's boring. We're going to cure them. But the fact is, when you do it as unto the Lord, every time you do anything, you are doing it for the King of Kings. And the, the, the thing is, you know, I used to do seminars on, on, I started doing, I've done business seminars, seminars on bi biblical principles in the workplace. Uh, and I, I did this, I started doing that in the early 90s and did it, I've done it around the world, actually, or a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And I, I started, when we first did this, I said, this is a, a biblical sem seminar for success in the workplace. And I think that lasted through one seminar. Right. One, because yeah. it was after the first one. After the first one, it dawned on me, and as I was talking mm -hmm. to people afterwards, if you ask 100 Christians how to define success, you'll get about 108, 110 different answers. I mean, it's like, and, and the fact of the matter is, the world has an entirely different set of goals or criteria for measuring success. Mm -hmm. How do you measure success? To me, I said, it's not a matter how much money you have in the bank. You know, you're going to leave it behind. Naked you came into the world, naked you go on out. Mm -hmm. It's not about how many letters you have after your name. Mm -hmm. It's not about the car you drive. It's not about the house you live in. You're going to measure by success by one thing and one thing only. Okay. That on the day that you come face to face with Lord God Almighty, you hear these words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because I don't care what you did. If you don't hear those words, you've not been a success. That's right. So that has to be your goal, is to be pleasing to God. That's a great goal. Absolutely. It's a great goal. Because God is not, he's not a harsh taskmaster. Like he, he took the people of God out of Egypt because they had a harsh taskmaster. You know, a loving father and a loving brother, a big brother, they want to tell you, boy, you did great. You did good. So that should be the goal. That's the words I want to hear, right? So then he goes, he's saying here, for this reason I suffer these things. He says, I know whom I have believed. If you talk to a lot of Christians, I think it is very, very common to get into a conversation about what they believe. But what you believe, mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I believe this. Oh, I believe that. And half the times you wind up in contention, you know. The fact is, I don't, I'm going to say this, and I say this judiciously. I don't care what you believe if you don't know in whom you believe. That's right. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know him, it doesn't matter what you believe. Okay. One of the early revelations in Scripture is this. Right from the beginning, in Genesis 4.1, I'm reading from the New King James, or for the King James, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. He said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, man-child. Mm -hmm. And that is the word that the King James used. I, I, you know, Adam knew Eve. I think uh, I think the American Standard says I, I he she had Adam had relations. If your Bible doesn't say 
that she that Adam knew Eve and she conceived and bore gave birth. Your Bible's wrong. All right. This is this is one of the problems with a lot of translation is we try and make it easy to understand or put it into common. The fact of the matter is what's important about this is when it says that Adam knew Eve, it comes from the Hebrew word yada. Okay, yada. I may pronounce it wrong, but that's what it is. And I believe that that comes from the Hebrew word for hand, which is yad. Yad and yada, all right? What it means is that that knowledge is based on touching. That it's intimate. Intimate. It's intimate. You know, you. I listen, I can say, I know a lot of females. That doesn't mean they got pregnant, because I knew them. I, you didn't have relations with them just because you knew them. Because you know what? That's not what God means by knowing. That's right. Because when God talks about I, Adam knew Eve, because God is looking for an intimate relationship. If you don't have an intimate relationship with God, if you don't have an intimate relationship with the Lord, you don't have a relationship with the Lord. You're kidding yourself. Yeah. We're, we're living in a time now when everybody's got 87, um, excuse my enthusiasm, 87 million Facebook friends, mm. and probably not one of them is necessarily a friend. Oh. They don't know them. Mm -hmm. To see their picture, to read that they posted this, that's not, not, that's not knowing. That's not intimacy. It's mm. not touching, all right? Social media is not intimacy. In most large churches, think about this. And even too many smaller ones, people may know others in the church without ever knowing them. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Alice and I met with a small group of pastors uh, a number of years ago uh, in a local church in Winter Park, Florida. And we, we had gotten together to talk about some missions work in the uh, Dominican Republic, all right? And the first thing we did, I think there were 10 or 12 of us there sitting around the table. And the first thing we did was just to go around the table. And because this was the first time most of us Everybody had met. Got together. Mm -hmm. And just introduce ourselves and said, you know, what we, what ministry we were from or what church we were from. And as we went around, we got to the, that end of the table. And a fellow stood up and he said, I'm so-and-so and I'm a pastor at this church, a large mega church mm -hmm. in the area. And he said, I'm a pastor. And the next guy got up and he said, well... I'm I'm a, a pastor at the same church. They didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. These yes. two quote unquote pastors from the same church didn't even know each other. That was the first time they met. That was the first. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, how do you do There's that? Something wrong with this picture. There's some, yes, it's unfortunate but very true that the shepherds, who are according to the word of God, to know well the conditions of the flock, as it says in Proverbs 27. All too often don't yada know them at all. They don't know. I mean, you, you can hear a lot of people go to big churches and they'll walk around and they'll talk about their pastor like, you know, you, you think they were having dinner together every night. Mm. But if the pastor met them on the street and just on, would he know them? Would he even recognize mm. them? I, that's a reasonable question. Right. Because I am talking about intimacy. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Did you ever read, I mean really read, the Song of Solomon? Mm -hmm. Don't hear many sermons preached from that. No. But it is a God-breathed celebration of intimate love. Yes. Maybe a little too intimate makes a little, some people shaky, right? It is instruction and encouragement for a husband and a wife brought together by the Lord mm -hmm. to love and give themselves to each other. Right. It's intimate. Yes. The husband says to his wife, you have made my heart beat faster, mm -hmm. my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices? It's all from the Song of Solomon. Mm. 
And the wife proclaims to her husband, how beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves. How handsome you are, my beloved, and so pleasant indeed. Our couch is luxuriant. When it says couch, that's talking about the marriage bed. Right. Is it sexual? You can <laughs> certainly bet that it is. It certainly is. Mm -hmm. And that is the invention of God, not Satan. Absolutely. It would seem, I mean, you start talking about sex and it's like, oh, that's of the devil. It's most assuredly not. He didn't come up with this idea. No. It was God's command, not a suggestion, that when he made Adam and Eve, well, you know, I got the verse here, I think. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. The only thing that Satan has about sex is he wants to corrupt it. Exactly. He wants to pervert it. And he's doing a, a seemingly he's great a job, job of it. Yeah. But God is the one that came up with the idea. And it's not just, as they said, that's a commandment of God, all right? It's about Jesus and his bride. And the people of God said, Amen. Okay. So then Paul says that he's talking kind of about what he has entrusted to God. What have you entrusted to God? What do I have to entrust to God? The earth, is, the earth is Lord's in the fullness thereof, and all it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it. Psalm 24, 1. Be very, very careful about entrusting to God what is already his. All right? Mm -hmm. There's a danger, and I, I've talked about this a lot. I don't want to get hung up on it. But about this whole concept that is flooding Christianity in the West, and I know in, in Africa and in, in Latin America, the whole concept of sowing a seed, all right? Mm, yes. There's a danger in sowing a seed to, in order to reap a reward. Mm. Everything already belongs to God, okay? Mm -hmm. If you give God something, you, you, all you're doing, if you're giving it to him to get a reward back, all you're doing is you're trusting God with what you think belongs to you, mm. and you're doing it to look for a greater return. That is not only heresy, it is a demonic, demonic plan. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. God says, as a man sows, so shall you reap. If you, but if you're doing it, if you're giving for greed to give, to get back, what you are doing is you have turned God into your financial advisor, taking care of your money for you so that you get a higher return. He's your investor. I'm going to tell you right now, he's not going to say that he's pleased with that. Mm -hmm. He's not going to look at that and say, well done. Mm -mm. Anything that you give God, he has given you. And that brings us to worship. Because worship is about giving to God mm -hmm. what is most precious to you. And you will find that he has already given that to you. So giving back to him is what is most precious, most to, precious you. to you. That's worship. We talked about Abraham and Isaac. Isaac was a blessing and a gift to Abraham. Mm -hmm. Abraham offered up Isaac to the Lord on Mount Moriah, and it was called worship. It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, took the two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And he said, Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. And I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Genesis 22, 3. Worship is about giving what is most precious to you back to the Lord. And you'll find whatever is precious to you that should be came from him. Right. And it still belongs to him. Be careful about what you say you entrust to God. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to sign off with this. There's two things that I know that I entrust to God my life and my wife Amen. and we'll talk about that next week so until then father we just thank you for this time we thank you for all of your good blessings 
We thank you, Lord, how you can use us for your glory to show forth your glory, your excellencies. And I pray that that would be our great desire, that as we go through this world, Lord, the people would see your life, your excellencies in our life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and goodbye until next week. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. Yeah.